Wells's association with Greg Toland was a match made in cinematic heaven. Like the director, Toland was a born exhibitionist and had an inbuilt compulsion to extend the boundaries of conventional feature film photography. At the time of Citizen Kane, he was under contract to Samuel Goldwyn Studios, but enjoyed the freedom to take outside commissions. And the Wells project was right up his street. Unfortunately, Wells had aroused the resentment of RKO's executives, many of whom felt that he was getting above himself in offering Toland a lucrative contract. So they stalled on the deal in the hope that the cinematographer would lose patience and take another job. But Toland was determined to stick with Wells and in fact started work without a contract. What's more, he brought with him his own crew of assistants from the Goldwyn Studios, along with a truckload of special photographic equipment that would help him create a different look for Citizen Kane. All of which caused fury in RKO's front office, and memos were sent to George Schaefer in New York warning that Wells' extravagant ways would take the project way over budget. I've never gone over schedule or over budget. There is a, a myth in the film community, for example, that Arson is an unreliable director, that he is profligate, uh, with no disrespect to uh, directors like uh, Mike Nichols and Michael Cimino and Spielberg and Coppola. Uh, Orson hasn't spent as much money in all the films he has made in his life as they have wasted in overage on any one film. And this is a simple statement of fact, and I, I dare say they would subscribe to it. In fact, we were under budget on Kane and under schedule, but we did that by a trick because uh, I said, I don't know anything about movies, so for about 10 days, I'm just going to shoot tests. And what we did was shoot Kane. We shot 10 days of Kane before we admitted we were actually shooting. But uh, we, were on, we, we would have been under schedule anyway. The first of these so-called tests were held one weekend at 9.20 a.m. on Saturday, June the 29th, 1940, while the RKO executives were swanning around on the golf course or in the country club. Wells took over the studio's projection theatre, crammed in a bunch of actors, and shot the scene which, in the film, would follow the newsreel sequence. It was his first attempt at directing actors on screen. Toland handled the sequence by shooting straight into blazing arc lights with the actors in silhouette. To cut down the glare, he applied a special coating to the camera lens. The result was that the stark contrast of bright lights and dark shadows heightened the effect of the dialogue. How are you, boys? Well, well, 70 years in a man's life. That's a lot to try to get into a newsreel. That last line, emerging from the darkness, was spoken by Joseph Cotton, who played Kane's friend Leland in the film. Now, at this point, the newsreel itself had not actually been shot, so the cast were reacting to a blank screen. However, with this projection room scene, filming on Citizen Kane finally began. Wells had taken a gamble that his experiment would work, and it did. Because it was shot unofficially, without the knowledge of the front office or the union, and without a full team of lighting technicians and props, he was already under budget and certainly under schedule, which wasn't hard because at this stage there was no schedule. This then was the start of the wells toland partnership, and what was to happen in the ensuing weeks would create cinematic history. Looking back to that summer of 1940, it's doubtful whether any other combination of director and cinematographer could have produced the images we now enjoy in Citizen Kane. Wells' insistence on universal focus throughout the movie was a challenge for Toland, but the director had his reasons for wanting everything in focus. All movies, he said, seem to be shot the same way. Foreground in focus, background out of focus. The eye doesn't see things that way. I want the audience to see everything as they would in life. And just to make things harder for Toland, Wells also went for long takes, which meant that the actors would have to deliver their lines as they would in a stage play, without cuts or pickups. Wherefore, Toland was compelled to choreograph his camera movements throughout an entire scene without enjoying the normal luxury of stopping to refocus. Well, this called for tremendous discipline from everyone, actors, lighting technicians, cameramen, and, of course, Wells, who, as the director, had to ensure that the scene was played at the right pace and without the need for edited intercuts. For this reason, he cast his own Mercury players, people who'd worked with him in both the theatre and on radio, and knew him well. As for the length of the takes, consider this famous scene which runs for almost four minutes. Shot mainly in two camera setups, it opens with young Kane playing in the snow, then pulls back into the room, keeping the boy in clear view while his future is being discussed by his parents and his guardian-to-be.
There's a great deal of movement here, as well as a lot of dialogue, yet every character and every item in the shot is in perfect focus throughout. One minute and 45 seconds in, as Kane's mother goes to the window, we have the first cut from the inside of the house to the outside. And now we're into the second setup. I've arranged for a tutor to meet us in Chicago. I'd have brought him here with me, but... Well, 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 that's quite a snowman. Did you make it all by yourself, my lad? Charles, you almost hurt me. What's that on the table? What's that to just lay with? Again, the characters are perfectly framed, the camera movement smoothly choreographed, and the shot ends after almost two minutes with a dramatic cut to a close up of the mother, the camera tilting down to an even more telling close up of the young Kane, and then a dissolve. Let's remember that this was filmed in 1940. Even today, a shot like that would be difficult to achieve. It took Wells just under four months to shoot Citizen Kane, and in that time, apart from certain special effect and process shots, which we'll come to shortly, he directed around 573 individual camera setups. Toland worked ceaselessly to ensure that every scene offered the same high standard of universal focus throughout. Some scenes, which were deemed impossible, had to be achieved through technical trickery, something Toland generally sought to avoid. This sequence, showing Kane typing in left foreground with Leland and Bernstein in background right, posed too many lighting problems. So it was filmed in two sections. Wells on the left was shot first, with the right half of the frame in darkness, his arm and the column beyond being the dividing line. Then Joseph Cotton and all of the right-hand background were filmed with the left of the frame blacked out. Wells and Cotton spoke their dialogue not to each other, but to a mark. The two shots were later combined in an optical printer, a device that Toland loathed because it was a duplicating process which degraded the sharpness of the original picture. By giving the set's ceilings, Wells planned a variety of low-angle shots which would further distinguish Citizen Kane from all other films. To achieve these, and to the horror of RKO's executives, trenches were dug in the studio's floor. They gave the camera flexibility, but in turn created real problems for the sound engineers because there was no space for their mic booms.